Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, having arrived today to this conference. And uh, it's a huge honor to start the first panel of the Three Cs One Opportunity Conference. And uh, we'll have like one and a half hour of discussion. Uh, within these one and a half hours, you will have to uh, will have the opportunity to ask your questions. And um, let me start uh, with our panelists. We have a wonderful panel today. Uh, with the panelists, uh, I will start from from the middle. The Tinatin Ahlidiani, who is a research fellow and the head of financial markets and institutions unit at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Welcome. We have uh, Oleksiy Polecki from the Polska Akademia Nauk, from Polish Academy of Science, uh, where he, uh, he also worked at the University of Antwerpen, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have Mr. Pavel uh, Musiawek from uh, Klub Jagiellonski, an important Polish uh, think tank uh, dealing with the most crucial tasks of uh, European security and uh, political cooperation, foreign policy. And uh, we have on the far left, uh, from me, far right from you, uh, Pavel Usov, who uh, is a political scientist originally from Belarus. He is a professor at uh, University of Warsaw, Universitet Warszawski. Uh, where he teaches uh, Eastern Europe studies and uh, foreign relations and politics. Welcome. And uh, our panel today is uh, dedicated to um, a topic toward a new intermarriage. And here I would like to ask my first question to Pavel Musavak. Uh, did we have an old intermarium already so we can discuss the new one? Yeah, thanks for this question. Uh, in, in Polish debate, uh, we uh, sometimes use uh, intermarium idea, but uh, mostly use uh, trimarium as a uh, as a as a project which is now on a table, the a project, political project that is realized, uh, uh, especially for the president of uh, President Andrzej Duda, which. Uh, uh, who in 2015, if I could remember, uh, started this uh, this new format. And uh, yes, there is some historical um, relation between in idea of intermarriage, which happened in po Polish debates uh, before the Second World War. Uh, but I don't think so. It is a good um, a good way to uh, looking for. Um, um, important uh, patterns in the past. I think that we have so many current uh, challenges, so many current uh, 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 current interests that we should uh, concentrate on, 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 on something new. So I am uh, uh, prefer uh, using intermarium, uh, not intermarium, sorry, uh, uh, use um, three C's initiatives as a, something that is uh, realized by, by politicians and, and want to underline why is um, why is so unique, so, so uh, unique, and why we should develop this uh, this format? I think we should start uh, to discuss about this uh, format with uh, the most important diagnosis that put um, uh, that put uh, uh, our countries together. I think that we have a lot of historical experience which follow up the, a lot of common interests, especially in the European Union and the NATO. And it is very interesting that before the, uh, this new three seas initiative um, format, there was no format like this to coordinate political stance uh, among European Union and, uh, and, and, and NATO. This is interesting because uh, taking into account so many, um, uh, so many uh, common interests and so many common uh, challenges uh, and common stage of development. I think that's that it was really for me understandable why uh, Central Europe didn't create such format before, uh, uh, taking into account that European Union we have a perfect. Uh, a Benelux uh, format, um, Scandinavian countries uh, cooperate each other perfectly, and it was uh, for me was very 
uh, unknown why uh, it's not happening in our part of the euro. So, so this project uh, started 2015. Now we have uh, many years of, uh, of some experience, but still we have at the beginning of the creating, I think, political uh, identity of this region. Uh -huh. And I think that we, I th I'm sure that um, later we will discuss about particular um, sectors, particular areas to cooperate, but we start with this diagnosis that, first of all, what we need is to build in self-awareness and self-interest and, and, um, and identity of this region, because I think that discussing with the many uh, people in the other part of this of this our region i didn't show that all of the people who live in this part of the europe uh, realized that this format is and and deeper cooperation in our region is is needed why is it that the last sentence in, uh, uh, on this uh, part of our discussion i think that after 20 years of joining the european union we experience um, uh, a big success uh, by means of economical development, GDP growth, those kind of things. But still, I think that it's not convert into political position. I think that this is very important thesis that uh, war in, uh, in Ukraine, um, many things, many many people think that change the situation and, uh, of course, change the policy toward Russia and Ukraine. But I think that didn't change our political position and. The only changes that I see is the changing of our political ambitions, but not political uh, position uh, at the moment. And uh, it is uh, visible in the European Union in many uh, areas uh, and in other format that uh, still the voice from our region is not uh, heard, uh, not, not here um, uh, equally with the with the voices from the Western Europe. So these old differences between between, uh, between the West Europe and Eastern part of the Europe still uh, play a role. And mm -hmm. our, the biggest uh, challenges is that we should uh, create a Europe with the both part which cooperate each other mm -hmm. on the partners, um, uh, partners uh, relations, not um, uh, as a past um, to be object, not the subject of, of, mm -hmm. of politics. That is that is an amazing introduction. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pavel. Uh, you've already already named like a group of important aspects, like the transfer, the transition from the economic development into political influence, the regional cooperation, the relations uh, with the EU, the uh, um, understanding of the importance of the countries by themselves, the uh, development of their, uh, of their uh, subjectivity and all the aspects we will definitely address during this discussion. But before we do that, I would, uh, I would like to, to ask my question to Alexei. Um, like, we, we see all this region with its influence in also in Ukraine and in other countries uh, of Central Europe. But some countries are still not the member of the project. Like if you look at the maps, like informal maps, which describe the 3C initiatives or Intermarium or you name it, uh, you will see, for example, that Ukraine is not being mentioned as the member of the project. What is the uh, regional, natural regional borders of uh, Intermarium or 3Cs? 3Cs? I suppose we should start from a little bit wider perspective because in general, you know, what Pavel mentioned that uh, this correlation between intermarium concept and pre cis initiative is a bit different. But last year actually brings back uh, this uh, geopolitical aspect. And after Russian invasion in Ukraine, uh, we cannot talk in this type of old shape of uh, previous established projects. So in general, the Free Seas initiative was kind of attempt to have this type of regional cooperation, but based on economical aspects. But because now we should bring back a uh, geopolitical aspects, so we are coming naturally to this idea of intermarium, where actually Russia was one of the main element of this geopolitical process. And uh, 
we should say probably honestly that previous uh, international organizations unfortunately didn't function. So it was not possible to prevent such aggression as it exists in the center of Europe. So it means we need to uh, rethink and re-establish some uh, ideas of regional and in general cooperation in Europe. That's why I suppose we will come naturally to more politically oriented uh, projects. And uh, in this case, purely economical aspects of uh, Free Seas Initiative should transform in something else. Or it will keep just kind of a very marginal, let's say, cooperation projects with some aspects of uh, economy, transportation, etc. But I'm a little bit more uh, like uh, I'm doubt that it will work, actually. And another point is uh, the question of Europe and, let's say, old Europe. So. Uh, for successful realization of uh, Intermarium or Free Seas Initiative, we have like two main points. First point, it's actually a reaction of uh, Germany or like other, let's say, more Western European countries, which could see it as a kind of challenge. Uh, and second point is actually Russia. And Russia, in a sense, uh, in much deeper perspective and wider perspective, what should we do with Russia and what it will go in Russia and how those processes would influence actually all the uh, uh, processes in the neighboring countries. So probably at this point I will stop because mm -hmm. it's another aspect which I will follow later. Yeah, that is interesting how you uh, how Russia is already appeared in our discussion, uh, and that is like the elephant in in the room, which we of course cannot cannot deny. Like even today, if you follow the news, uh, this night, uh, Ukrainian capital Kiev has been attacked by the Russian uh, ballistic missiles. Like uh, Ukrainian air defense has mentioned, has claimed like to have destroyed at least like six uh, hypersonic missiles. Um, we don't know the details, but uh, that is, of course, like while well, we are sitting here in the uh, in the peaceful city of Warsaw and peaceful Poland under uh, protection of Polish army and uh, NATO forces, uh, we know that uh, the fighting is uh, continuing, and every political project or economic project is is directly related to uh, to the to to this war. But as you have mentioned already, the the economy. I would like to to pass the uh, the next question to Tina, and um, because Tina uh, is researching economy in Brussels in Center for European Policy Studies, and we have talked before this panel uh, about like how important is the economic cooperation. Uh, for 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 uh, three C's initiative, but still, is it where are more chances for the project in economy or in policy, or is it important? Is it impossible to pull a line between economy and policy? Yeah, thanks a lot. I think it's working. Um, so the I think the starting point is really that uh, I also voice the you know voices of Brussels. Uh, very puzzling uh, views and some controversies around the idea because there is some skepticism that you know this is the Polish way of you know show the leadership or maybe show the dominance. But what is this initiative really? I mean, the initiative, as we figured out on the several summits as they've emerged over the past year, and now after the Riga summit, it was put clear that this is the regional uh, project, right? For mainly for developing infrastructure. However, I mean, as an economist, I look at it, and do we have any sectoral cooperation in any sector in any country? Not really. So far, what we had, what the initiative had, it's so far mainly very political at the presidential level. So it's like we call it uh, the infrastructure project with no cooperation whatsoever at sectoral level and very high political cooperation. So that is a very puzzling start within itself, within itself inherently contradictive. And if we talk about it as an infrastructure project, then, um, and referring to your question, whether it can be economic po cooperation or where we can draw the line between economics and politics, uh, it's very difficult because the region itself is very geostrategic. 
Uh, we see that by the engagement and all the attention it triggered, both from the United States, across Atlantic, China, uh, because it ticks all the boxes that China wants to develop investments in this region, and also Russia, right? We have huge energy dependence exactly in this region on Russia. Uh, so I don't think we can separate economic cooperation from geostrategic meaning of it. Uh, however, I do think because of its location, because of infrastructural investments that are indeed needed to connect the region better, the key focus should be really on really kicking off economic cooperation. Now, why I'm saying that? If this initiative states at the level of you know, presidential connections, you know, the, the governments change, the presidents change, that it may you know, lead nowhere. Like the Trump pledged uh, 1 billion investments. What do we have right now? We have a new president in the US. We have only 300 billion investments uh, you know, promised. That's changed. We have a change in government in Croatia. What do we have? Change, you know, um, attention. The same with Czech Republic. Uh, previously, very much of a skepticism. Now there is more hope. But the initiative cannot flourish if it really remains at that level. We need more sectoral cooperation. And let me refer to a few, a few numbers in a general term, so I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, by 2030, according to the study, uh, the investments needed in this region to better connect it, uh, you know, goes over 500 billion euros. Most of it is needed in infrastructure, rail, roads. Uh, then the second priority in terms of money is digital because there is a huge potential and digital infrastructure and skills are not there yet. And the third one is on energy. Mm -hmm. uh, again, energy, it can be a bit confusing for the audience why there is no more investments needed in energy. It's because we talk about intra-EU block. So within the EU, these countries are still better connected through the energy than, you know, for instance, Ukraine or Moldova or outside countries. Uh, but uh, indeed, there is a lot of potential, which is not really tapped. Uh, there is a there is a need for the investments now. The investment fund is set up, mm -hmm. uh, but again, up to one billion right now. The target is five billion mm -hmm. to have it, and then it's supposed to generate one hundred billion yeah. investments. It's a lot of money, and we see how it goes. So far, we have lack of support also from the member states outside, let's say, Poland, uh, you know, to initiate strategic projects and then to secure money for it. So maybe I'll stop here. But, uh, if I may, uh, like, ask you um, another, another one question, because, like, uh, it's what you told. Uh, I think it's, it's essential for understanding of how, uh, how this region can, can cooperate on the, on the economic level and uh, with what consequences. Um, like when we talk about the economic cooperation in the region, we, 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 we have like many countries which had like their different uh, orientations for their economies. Uh, like um, if you look on the Baltic states and Poland and um, let me say like on, 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 on Czechia, uh, you will see like three different uh, economic models. And uh, most of the countries, like except the Baltic states, uh, they have their own monetary policy, like they're not in the Eurozone. Uh, and uh, they are all like striving economies who try like to overpass the, uh, the old Europe, if I may use this, uh, this politically like biased term. Uh, how does it, how is it seen from the Brussels? Is it seen as emerging of the new uh, cooperation at economy and monetary level, which is like outside of the sphere of control of the Brussels? Is it look as a competition or is it like so low scale under the radar that we don't pay attention for that? It's a very good question. Now, um, economic wise, yeah, there is definitely the Eurozone. Um, Frankly speaking, I don't think there is so much attention yet devoted to the initiative, and I'm all for it. We should really pay more attention to it, but it's also the way initiative positions itself. Uh, I think it has been relieving to really uh, underline that this is not a competing within the EU's cohesion policy, but it's rather complementary, which makes sense because we don't need more, you know, scattering of the efforts. What we need is joining forces because we talk uh, of the need about a lot of money and investments. Uh, but in terms of economic influence, um, it's not really about whether the countries are into necessarily in Eurozone or not. It's about how they develop. And what you've mentioned is the key, Sergei, they're very heterogeneous. We have Bulgaria, the poorest in the EU. We have Poland, very 
very, very high growth, economic growth, they are very, very different. They have very different needs. And, uh, you know, let's uh, Brussels be alone within the bloc. I don't think it's even clear for the member states who are the members of the initiative, you know, how this is going to kick off economic cooperation. Will the smaller states or the states which are poorer have more, you know, kickoff start? Will they have more benefits? Also, what will happen with the support of Ukraine? Because Ukraine is now the partner country and there will be, you know, a lot more financial needs for, for Ukraine. So there are a lot of unresolved questions and I think doubts and also concerns within the bloc. So for Brussels, we'll take, um, you know, take over uh, as long as the initiative, you know, unfolds and shows basically its position. But I think a lot of clarifications and focus points should come from within um, the initiative. Uh, the other than that, I think uh, Brussels is currently very busy with resolving all the issues emerging from the war. And uh, Central and Eastern European states, in particular Poland, plays a very, very pivotal role in it. So I think uh, Brussels' eyes very much remain here. Thank you, thank you, it's amazing. Thank you for your insights. Uh, the next question goes to, to Pavel Osov and uh, you, have like your extensive experience of dealing with uh, with the eastern uh, eastern borders of uh, the European Union and Poland. Um, you worked for a longer time in Belarus, and uh, we know that since years, even before this full scale invasion of Russia uh, in Ukraine, uh, we had all these tensions on the EU Belarusian border the crisis on uh, the Polish-Belarusian border, on the Lithuanian-Belarusian border, as uh, Belarusian dictator Lukashenko tried, to, uh, tried to, 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 to pump migrants from the, uh, from, the central, uh, from the Middle East into the European countries, like to undermine the security of the, of the both nations. And uh, Poland and Lithuania had to mitigate this crisis and to protect their uh, borders. Uh, be beyond these bilateral security aspects, can Intermarium or 3 cs initiative be successful instruments in dealing with uh, local security issues on the EU border, like Belarus, for example? Thank you. Uh, it's a very important question because it's helped us to answer the question, what is Intermarium? First of all, um, the problem is that uh, Intermarium or Three Seas Initiative is not geopolitical power, no geopolitical forces. Even, unfortunately, we should emphasize this, that even European Union is not a, a strong geopolitical power to influence uh, regional uh, situation or regional process or even resist uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine. We observe it. Uh, different initiatives, uh, different supports, different position, even taking into the consideration the position of the Hungary, which uh, is against uh, sanction or tough position toward uh, Russia. So what could we say about Intermarium? So it is not a geopolitical power, it's just an initiative, it's just a concept, even more economic concept than political or geopolitical uh, concept, because uh, Every uh, real initiative should have essence, uh, should have a serious component. It is secure component and military component. Uh, both of these components is absolutely absent in, in the intermarium. Probably in the future we will observe the development of this component, first of all, military component. But we, we see that all this country are under the NATO uh, uh, NATO protection, they haven't own military concept, they haven't uh, own a military doctrine or um, a geopolitical doctrine or um, a concept of the development of the future. And as, as for me, uh, the concept of Lublin tri triangle has much more geopolitical vision and uh, um, uh, philosophical uh, prospect than even intermarium and without the development of the philosophical political concept uh, intermarium three C's inter intermarium concept uh, will remain only concept uh, without uh, a real essential <coughs> essential political or geopolitical doctrine uh, regarding belarus so um, uh, speaking about belarus in 2021 and this uh, migrant crisis uh, also we should understand what it was 
It was an element of the hybrid war which was unleashed by Russia against Belarus and against, uh, against European Union, especially against these regional countries. Why it was unleashed against Belarus? Because the main goal of Putin, uh, starting uh, from 2020, this electoral crisis in Belarus, was uh, the uh, Putin control over Belarus. Uh, supporting Lukashenko and supporting his ideoid uh, crazy activity like uh, migrant crisis or landing rain air airplane uh, in Belarus, it was an instrument to make uh, to made to make Lukashenko much more dependent on Russia, and and uh, Putin successfully did it. Actually, um, to the end of 2020, Belarus was completely occupied by Russians. Uh, politically and geostrategically, yeah, with the formal political autonomy of uh, Lukashenko, but in reality, regarding strategical element, geopolitical element, Belarus was completely under the Russian control. And this migrant crisis was used uh, to isolate much more Belarus from the relations, with, uh, from any relations with the uh, West, to uh, uh, to. Uh, creates the image of Lukashenko as a crazy guy and almost all politicians try to solve, uh, uh, European politicians try to solve mig migrant crisis in Belarus via Putin, calling to the Putin, asking him stop Lukashenko. Uh, and uh, it was a, a really uh, very clear uh, trap which was made by Putin and using this crisis uh, Putin, Moscow put complete control over Belarus and then later use it uh, as a trampoline against the war uh, during the invasion against uh, against uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, attacking Kyiv. So uh, I believe that uh, neither intermarium uh, this group of the countries, nor European Union and even NATO wasn't uh, uh, ready wasn't able to resolve this crisis. And uh, yeah, I believe that the position of uh, European Union during this crisis was correct, putting the tough control over the border, but uh, uh, they were not able to prognose uh, to, uh, to what situation this crisis uh, would bring. Yeah, but uh, that is exactly uh, what I think is essential in in in, in this situation. The uh, in that crisis, in that uh, clear hybrid attack uh, by Lukashenko and Putin against the EU members, the EU members like Poland or Lithuania had to act alone. They were not supported by the EU, for example, and. Is intermarium uh, a political union with enough common, uh, with enough, uh, with enough chances to act as a common space with common interests and common policy, or in such crises like uh, in such crises like Belarusian crisis or other crises we can imagine, uh, the single members will have to act on their own. In this particular situation, they, uh, I mean, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, they, they act uh, by, as a separate countries, uh, asking support, financial support. We shouldn't say that the European Union um, didn't help. They support the idea to build in the war, wall uh, mm -hmm. in, in Poland, Belarusian border, also Lithuania, Belarusian border, the activity of the uh, this common strategy of frontier. Uh, but uh, in a uh, serious crisis, uh, hybrid crisis, the military crisis, uh, intermarion for that moment is not ready to act in any d direction, just with uh, uh, some kind of uh, political uh, condemned uh, declaration. But as I remember, during this crisis there wasn't any uh, public allowed position of uh, the member state of this intermarion 
uh, initiative. It was only the position of European Union. Even uh, I don't remember, maybe someone uh, correct me, there wasn't position of, of the Visegrad initiative, which was, which was is much more older and much more integrated as an even intermarium initiative. Uh, what is the need uh, to do uh, regarding the future of uh, this initiative? I believe this creation uh, common security uh, center, uh, which uh, would be able to exchange information, sensitive information about the situation in the region, about the threats for the region. Uh, also thinking about um, regular Ex uh, military exercises of, of these countries. I, I know that in uh, Bl uh, Black Sea there is regular exercises, but regarding this common space, uh, it should be also done. And uh, during this uh, migrant crisis, speak, uh, speaking without, with uh, Polish politicians and Lithuanian politicians, I propose them to create uh, forces of the rapid reaction. Uh, in the region, Lithuanian, Poland, uh, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and even Romania. They could create this, uh, uh, or think about creation of these uh, forces for, uh, for um, a, re a rapid reaction on different challenges. But uh, 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 no, no, um, there wasn't any, any, any process in this direction because everybody rely on NATO. That NATO re um, protect us and uh, we shouldn't care about our own, own forces or regional forces. But the regional forces, creation of the regional forces, it's, it will be an example that it is a real geopolitical uh, strength, a uh, real geopolitical power. But even European Union, uh, since... Uh, uh, 1950 hasn't uh, own uh, forces, uh, rapid uh, uh, reaction forces or something like that. That's indeed uh, um, an interesting question, like how much of uh, security cooperation, how much of, of uh, independent action uh, a regional alliance can uh, create and can, can allow itself like, to have without going into competition with the existing alliances which the countries are members of. Uh, Pavel, uh, my next question is for you, and that is actually a continuation of the discussion. Like, uh, what has been like already mentioned by Pavel and by Tina, uh, is Intermarium uh, a competing project, or is it uh, a project which adds more value to existing unions? Like I can remember uh, many talks with uh, like people from Ukraine and from Poland, from Germany too, when we were talking about a possible accession of Ukraine into into the EU. And one of fears was I'm not sure how much like Germany skepsis was in that uh, ideas, but many people said we're afraid that Germany is not interested in having another one Poland in the EU. Because um, like when you, countries in the EU, like you have, comp you have competition, you have discussion, the country has veto rights, etc., and that is not what, uh, what people would risk having Ukraine on board, uh, or at least they will try to avoid. Uh, when, from your perspective, when the West European countries like Germany or France when they witness the creation of Intermarium project with its political interests and combining political powers of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the countries, is it being seen as a competing project, as a threat, or as an addition? Or will Germany try to join Intermarium? We know that uh, Germany was not on board out of many reasons. Yeah, what about, uh, what about the Germany? Um, uh, creating this uh, project by uh, President Duda uh, uh, was um, in 2015 when our president and the government sent the signal that this project is not against European Union, was not against particular countries. Uh, this is something that uh, should be added value and should uh, give the 
countries uh, of our region more uh, resources, more uh, solidarity. So uh, on the political message, there was any uh, anyone signal that we are against uh, particular countries. But what is interesting in po in Poland, uh, we before the war and after the war, especially discussed about our relation with the Germany, uh, discuss, discuss uh, uh, relation with the mainstream of the Europe. So uh, Germany, Germany and France, and general Western Europe, uh, because. Uh, as we know, there are some differences of interest that create some tension, so that's why this topic is, is, is hot all the time in Poland. And a lot of people in Poland is, uh, um, who uh, read about the Treaties Initiatives um, think that this project uh, has a good political uh, meaning, has a, uh, has a uh, potential to uh, to to, to replace the policy of uh, countries of our region from bandwagoning toward Germany to balancing toward Germany. And um, I think that it is um, not a direct aim of, the, uh, of this project, but I think that uh, if we realize uh, the all goals, uh, all aims which is behind this project, yes, the consequences of that is that uh, political influence of Germany and other countries in this region will be limited. Wh why? Because uh, it is natural that if uh, um, you have the country that is don't have political identity, which cooperate each other, but on a very technical level, not on the uh, not coordinate political stance. For example, in the European Union, it is easier for, for Germany to, you know, play the, the own interest, especially when you take into account uh, the big economic economic uh, ties between Germany and uh, particular countries in our region. So, so uh, 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 I think that it, it was good decision to uh, loudly speaking that there is no competition and concentrate on a technical cooperation, particular areas like infrastructure, like energy, like uh, economical ties. But behind this, of course, all, all project, it is a uh, diagnosis that yes, we should build uh, political majority. And it means that our uh, relations with the uh, Germany should be replaced. Not, should, should not be conflicted, but should be built on a partner's level so we shouldn't be areas where uh, where are object of policy. As I mentioned in my first speech, should be subject of the, of, of, of the policy. And, and this and this change, of course, is a change that could happen only in a longer time. So it is not like aim for the next five years or ten years. It is long term process. Uh, but I think that it is achievable but only in case we put much more substance, much more essence in, in the, the Trimario initiatives. The problem of this, uh, of this project is that we build a good political framework. As, uh, as you mentioned, we organize year by year summit and that's good things and interest by, for example, United States was uh, quite okay, but if you take into account the numbers, these, uh, uh, these in, um, invest um, from the other countries or inside countries in this project uh, was uh, was limited. So this is the work for all the country in uh, our part of the Europe to to invest more political resources and economical resources to to build something something big something big and. After many years of the uh, intense cooperation, the result will be uh, the, the result could be uh, building uh, uh, a real meaning of this region. Uh, so long time process, not short time uh, short term uh, policy. But when we look at the uh, at these projects, like from the perspective uh, of Berlin, and I'm sorry for bringing. Berlin to that uh, to that to that discussion, but as a person who is based in Berlin for for a German think tank, I cannot escape this framework. Uh, when you when you look at the intermarium development, you can imagine that for certain German politicians, this project can look like like a danger. 
like uh, they would interpret it as an attempt of Poland to expand into the region, which Germans believed to have as their backyard, and to make Poland uh, stronger politically, geographically, economically, on security level. Uh, because, of course, in this, in, this, uh, in this territory, from in this region, from the Baltic Sea to Adriatic or to, Baltic, or to, or to the Black Sea, uh, Poland is naturally dominated by its size, by its economic development, and uh, these German politicians will look at the development and say, okay, like, like Poland is trying to create its own European Union, like we Germans dominated in the EU, Poland, Poles want to dominate in the region. I don't say that it's bad. Like I pretty welcome the uh, development of Poland, looking at what fantastic role Poland played uh, supporting Ukraine. But is not this project had uh, isn't this project heading towards a natural collision with the German perception of what is good for Europe? Yes, I think collision is a good word. Danger is too strong, I think, because we are not uh, in this project on a stage that create a. a, 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 a big political consequences so far. So that's why, uh, uh, yes, that, that's true that at the beginning when this project started, there are some un uh, untrust from the Berlin, the, you know, politicians and, and people from, from the Germany, you know, ask about this project many times. I remember a lot of discussion like that. Uh, why uh, Poland decide to, to send a smoothly uh, political message that it is not, it shouldn't be interpreted interpret as a danger because uh, you should remember that uh, a lot of countries in our region uh, didn't want to uh, confront with the Germany because of the ties. I remember discussion with the uh, think tankers from the Czech Republic uh, six years ago, seven years ago, about this uh, project when it started. I, and I remember uh, their question, okay, but what about the Germany? It is against, because it, if it is against, we are sorry, we are not okay with this project, uh, and uh, all the time we, we have to uh, uh, answer that no, that's only about our uh, multilateral cooperation, don't, so don't be afraid of uh, sending any negative uh, signal to Berlin. But what is interesting, after the, the war uh, on Ukraine started, uh, started, I mean, of course, a uh, large-scale um, attack, uh, the situation is changing. I think that uh, some atmosphere in our part of the uh, Europe is changing. And I remember discussion last year with the, uh, my Czech colleagues, and they uh, they asked me about this uh, this project, what's going on inside. And uh, I think that a lot of countries see that you know attitude towards uh, general Easter part of the uh, Europe from the from the Berlin was not interpreted. Okay, uh, by Czech, by Slovak, by by other other countries, uh, they feel that it is not about the policy toward Russia, but it's the problem is Berlin not take into account our uh, um, uh, need for security in the way we expected from Berlin, and this is the most important problems. Mm -hmm. And 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 I ask my my uh, my Czech uh, friends, okay, so uh, after the war, after this all discussion about the why Germany is slow, so uh, um, so slow with the, with the help to Ukraine. Uh, 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 Will you join the, the Poland to, to confront with this policy and confront with the mainstream in Europe? And the answer was very interesting. We don't need to confront with the mainstream because now we are main, mainstream. Of course, it was uh, true, but only in the case of support towards Ukraine. But it is uh, unfortunately not true taking into account other areas. And I think that now on the table we have a lot of areas where these uh, uh, the common stands should be uh, 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 building uh, uh, more with more intense uh, way. I mean, for example, we ha we are starting in European Union Fit for 55 uh, uh, package. Uh, we are uh, discussed about the transfer some uh, funds from the from the east towards south, because south of the Europe is starting to be the most important problems because, you know, our, our part of the region, uh, you know, lag behind by, by means of GDP 
per capita, but uh, but 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 uh, uh, on the south there is a political tensions, political problems because there is a you know society where didn't experience um, any GDP growth at all uh, since the last decade. So so there is a pressure to 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 change the direction of the of the money. So a lot of a lot of on the table uh, challenges that I think that could really build solidarity and build a common stance. Of course, be realistic. Not each, not each interests uh, are, are are similar, and there is some tensions inside uh, these countries. That's true, but still a lot of space for cooperation, a lot of space for uh, for uh, for building uh, solidarity, identity, and 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 after that, building a political mass, which in the end uh, will uh, uh, will I think result in uh, building building something bigger in this part of the Europe. Thank you, uh, Alexei. Um, is like when we look at the Intermarium uh, project. Uh, we have already mentioned that Ukraine was not on board from the from the very beginning, but now with all the political ties, uh, security ties, and also human ties, like we know how many Ukrainian refugees are living now in Poland and in in, in other countries of the region, is Ukraine de facto a part of this project? Well. No, if you are talking about like free sea, which I mentioned before, of course uh, Ukraine was not part because it was framed to be project actually in the frame of EU funding, etc. But as it was already mentioned, the essence of uh, current situation is that we what were like the common interest in this region. And I suppose the security reasons uh, mainly will dictate the needs to cooperate more deeply. If we will look on the like, ground in the practice, actually right now we have already kind of established cooperation. In security terms, of course, Poland, Baltic states and Ukraine already established quite functional, let's say, union in the frame of other unions, but we cannot see such a common vision, uh, for example, a little bit in the West, let's say Germany. But again, as Pavel mentioned, that uh, the initiatives came already to the East, not because even like Poland was so interested to become the main players in this region, but because someone need to take some steps. And if you are still uh, quite slow and careful about some steps, but you have uh, challenges which you cannot uh, just live for tomorrow, someone would take this initiative. And we can see that naturally this region, first of all, because of security interests, because of potential dangers from Russia, of course, would dictate more deeper cooperations. And Ukraine in this case would be uh, one of the main element. And I suppose it already naturally appears. And especially taking into account that Ukraine slowly, but anyway, the direction is already established, will go to the EU direction. I mean, in technical aspects, integration process. So it will eliminate many, let's say, legal and uh, other borders, which prevents previously for Ukraine to be included in these initiatives. But I suppose uh, as uh, infrastructural, economical, poorly economical uh, project, free C initiative will transform in something else or it will be substituted by something else. And this type of maybe old concept of intermarium would rather substitute the, uh, the free sea initiative just by effect of cooperations. And another point here is, of course, it's Belarus, because it's also, after Ukraine, I suppose, it's a second major question in this region, because in any case, it can take time, but anyway, changes in Belarus would appear. And it's also the main 
first of all, security question for countries around of Belarus, yeah. but also potentially it's question of uh, economical cooperation, etc., etc. Uh, and it's about vision, how we would transform our so-called like Ostpolitik, which existed before, I mean before 22, in something else. And of course, Russia is still appears as a one of the main problem, which would influence this natural, uh, uh, let's say, way to deeply cooperate of countries which are neighboring uh, Russia. And uh, we can imagine that Putin would disappear, but would it transform Russia into a democratic state? No. Uh, would it be still challenge? Yes. Uh, would uh, countries neighboring Russia need to build their own policy and to deal with Russia? And I suppose in Russia, the number of problems would appear uh, definitely uh, humanitarian, military, economic, and of course security. And in any case, those countries around like Russia would establish more deeper cooperation based on this uh, interest. And the um, humanitarian aspect, of course, and you know, human interactions, it's also very important because uh, we have already a long history of um, interpersonal relations between countries neighboring Ukraine, first of all, Poland. But even on the aspect that so many uh, Ukrainians who live uh, now in Europe, some of them, they would stay probably, some of them would they come back. Uh, and it will also bring some changes in the country because it's anyway, it's changed people's mind. And I suppose it will be kind of push for Ukraine for quicker, uh, reforming and quicker uh, adaptation to more European standards in many aspects. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think it's very interesting how you mentioned the uh, uh, the role of economy in integrating the region and that actually like any project competes uh, not directly but indirectly as an idea with others and if one project is not successful enough it is being uh, replaced by other ideas. And that is that is indeed what we are witnessing for 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 decades. We know that Visegrad group still has like some problems. Like, is it alive or is it not? We don't know. Uh, but for sure, the the need for intermarium would not have existed if uh, there had been like other cooperation projects which would have demonstrated their effect. Uh, Tina, my next question is for you. Like. Uh, the economic cooperation of the of this region uh, extremely depends on the EU framework, but still, can like new ways of this uh, economic cooperation exist outside of the EU framework? Like when we think about infrastructure project, energy uh, transit lines, like transport corridors, etc., can or can it only be like formed? Uh, by the EU, by the EU economic policy. Indeed. So, as I already mentioned, uh, there is a lot of money we are talking about that needs to be invested to have desired targets in infrastructure, energy, and digital frameworks. And by the default, this implies joining the forces and uh, finding the most efficient solutions. So, this has to be built on what is already available. Um, I must say the Central and Eastern European countries, the countries that are part of this initiative, have been the largest beneficiary already of the EU's cohesion policy and cohesion funds. And this is why the economic growth has been really, really impressive in this region. One of the, uh, one of the many variables, many key variables, was the EU funds that inflowed in this region. And this is a starting point. Um, however, what I had in mind and what we see now is the lack of private funding um, into the investment projects. Because if we have a look at how the investment projects are built in the western part of Europe, it's always the 60% to uh, 40%. So the 60% comes from the private money. And only the 40% comes from the public money. That's the target that we should achieve in this part of the Europe. And this is why the bringing in the private uh, 
uh, interest, private ownership is very, very key. I think Pavel mentioned that there are indeed uh, every year we have now the business forums taking place and civil society forums as well. This has to have more systemic character and this is how we can build more sectoral cooperation and having more ownership from the private sector. So that is what is lacking there um, and that would be a big, big, uh, very beneficial one. Another one that is the EU and should be the EU uh, baseline is the EU regulatory framework. Now when we talk about infrastructure, digital energy, there is the core of the EU legislation that exists that is still being crafted when it comes to digital. We have all the new pieces of legislation, Digital Services Act, uh, cyber, you know, cyber is very important. When you connect something digitally, you have to make sure it's also secure in terms of cyber. And there is a Absolutely new, you know, umbrella, new, new, uh, new batch of EU regulations, directives, and digital policy, and it's very good that this initiative really takes over from there, and that's the EU baseline of it. Uh, as these pieces of legislations are very new, it's not only about you know legislative approximation or adoption of the new rules, but it's all about implementation. We have to see how the all the EU member states implement it, let alone the central and eastern part, but also the western part. Uh, but it it will be a lot of sharing best practices, having the EU rules as the baseline, and then bringing the private sector in it. And in addition, I would say we are talking about the Black Sea. Well, across the three seas. Now, Adriatic Sea, we have the Balkan countries that are very important, not to be forget forgotten. But also the Black Sea, um, we have Georgia. And, uh, well, I originally come from Georgia as well, but um, the, the Georgia cannot be left aside because now we're talking about Ukraine and Moldova. But there is also Georgia, who is potential candidate country. And why I'm mentioning uh, this country is because uh, EU has its global gateway strategy. And under it, we already have two cables under the Black Sea, which is the, the electricity cable and the digital cable as part of it. So if this initiative wants to be a good, you know, uh, thing that builds on the EU's policy, it has to also incorporate countries or at least, you know, take into account what's going on in the Black Sea to the fullest extent where you cannot really expel Georgia and even Azerbaijan because there is a fourth sea, which is Caspian Sea. But again, it is very important to bring and connect the Central Asia through that. So this is alternative to the route uh, via Russia and actually Belarus. So these things cannot be, you know, set aside. Um, so these, and uh, earlier, it is part of the agenda somehow, the better it is. What we saw, uh, what is going now in Ukraine, this is exactly the lateness of action, lateness of planning. Uh, we saw, but what we also saw is when there is a wheel, uh, you know, there is a way, uh, Ukraine has been sinked with electricity, the grid in unprecedented speed because there was the crisis before the war that has been taking forever. But it's very costly. When you do that so fast, it's extremely costly. Who is paying for it? This is EU who is paying for it. This is the member states who support Ukraine, such as Poland, the biggest supporter when it comes to the member states. Mm -hmm. So the earlier we plan it, earlier it becomes the part of the agenda, simply the better and the most efficient it is. So I think these initiatives should, should also pay attention to the you know, wider spectrum of what's going on in the region. That is amazing. That's actually what I wanted to ask you next, because, uh, like, uh, first, the, the EU integration of Ukraine will, will take this way or another way. Um, like, it is inevitable. And after this war is, uh, is over, uh, there will, like, uh, huge funds needed for investment, and most probably uh, the investments will not come only through Brussels, but also, like, bilaterally. From, from the countries of the region. But then the, the further expansion of the security and peace and uh, democracy uh, area will take place. And uh, Georgia is a natural part of this, of this, uh, of this uh, room, like the democratic process in Georgia started even before the Ukraine revolution of dignity, like it was like the first, the first, uh, the first Maidan happened not in Kyiv, but in Tbilisi, we, uh, we remember that. And what can be like, can Intermarium be fit for that expanding? You also like mentioned far looking plans like Four Seas Initiative, including the Caspian Sea. Like, is it not uh, like a piece of cake too big to, to swallow? No, yeah, I think first we should really focus on the three C's and then pick up on that later and uh, yeah, really now kick off. However, um, 
as it was, uh, you know, set and put uh, in line with the declaration of the Riga summit, uh, the initiative really welcomes the applications of Georgia and Moldova, and it's now very clear that in general initiative will welcome other parties outside of the European Union who stand on democratic and EU values. I mean, obviously, Georgia and Moldova belong to this category. So there is a room for at least these two countries <laughs> to be taken into account. We already saw uh, the president with Ukraine having par partnership, partner status, but we also saw the initiative really remained intra-EU. So it was set up for the EU. It remains intra-EU, which is, which is fine. Uh, we have to see to what extent cooperation with Ukraine will go ahead. Uh, but again, uh, I think at least bringing on board the countries which already moved from the association to the enlargement basket, Moldova and Georgia, I mean, there is time and there is a high time for it. For Azerbaijan, um, the, the thing is, when it comes to only economic cooperation, indeed that must be taken into account, but... Uh, Again, in line with the, uh, with the you know, defining uh, principles and also the Riga Summit Declaration, I don't think, I mean, Azerbaijan currently follows democratic, particularly democratic rules. So that's a bit of a tricky, right? And I think we will also see how the initiative will go and uh, to what extent it will have economic nature. Uh, but there will be definitely some ways to cooperate at least um, in economic direction. Uh, but I think there is a lot to, to do, first of all, on the treaties, and maybe later on this is definitely a next stage on particular, you know, sectoral projects, we can have it. But I would not necessarily see Azerbaijan right now as a partners like Ukraine, uh, yeah, Moldova or Georgia. Yeah, that is that is amazing. And yes, uh, the, the the case that you mentioned, Moldova, is uh, of course extremely important. That Moldova is being uh, pretty often uh, like left outside of the discussion, although the the importance of Moldova in the region is is extremely is extremely high. We know it also not only because of the current Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also of, of the other projects. But uh, when we talk about, and that is maybe my, my, my last question to you before we, we can uh, move to the questions from the, from the audience, uh, if you would name the uh, economic activities and economic cooperation projects in the sectors or in particular areas, uh, what could be the the first priority, the, the low-hanging fruit of Intermari? Uh, definitely infrastructure. <laughs> uh, I think uh, there is also a study, I, unfortunately I cannot quote the others, but I think it was a very good um, comparison. Uh, that, you know, the similar paths like from Tallinn to Constanza, you know, the north to south takes like three and a half days, while the same distance in the west part of, uh, of Europe can be done simply one day within the rail. I think it's a very good example how badly these, you know, countries are simply connected when it comes to basic infrastructure, the rail or even the roads. And that has the Soviet past to it, because within the Soviet, it was not really priority to have regional connections, but it was all about to connect them within the center of the Soviet bloc uh, and this is so that the countries didn't have a fair start like in the Western Europe so that's definitely it and this is where we see most of the investments that are needed exactly in infrastructure and then comes then comes digital and um, and infrastructure is the one that also requires private sector on board. Thank you, thank you, Tina. Uh, that was uh, amazing insights, like from from our panelists, and I think that uh, you should take the opportunity to address them directly and ask your questions. I'm sure you have um, a lot of them. Please raise your hand, and uh, yeah, start. If not, I have like several questions left, which I would love to to to, to ask, but. Yeah. So, if, if 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 no questions from from uh, from the public is uh, is is available uh, yet, but you still may may think about it, then I would uh, be I would be happy to address uh, Pavel because, uh, like, what you you talk about the uh, possible chances for the regional cooperation, like rapid response forces, etc. Um, what do you think? Like, is uh, the lack of such uh, of such activities in the field? Is it because the uh, uh, member countries of the Intermarium project uh, do not like think that they could establish like that, or is it like a lack of the legal framework, or what is the reason for that? 
So we, we should take into the consideration that this initiative through my room is an initiative of Union, uh, European Union member states. And uh, this initiative uh, is uh, developing inside European Union. It is uh, not um, separate geopolitical, or political, or economic union. It's uh, still the part of European Union, which is if uh, some kind of initiative uh, is, is appearing, like communication, like developing of the infrastructure, uh, all this initiative I realized uh, by the European Union money. Because uh, Intermario initiative has not own budget, has not uh, own mm, uh, a huge sum of money for realization, any kind of project like uh, uh, <clears throat> roads from Baltic states to, to the Greece. Uh, all these projects are realized by um, European Union. So in this case, uh, for that moment, uh, Intermarium has no opportunity to realize such uh, important initiatives like uh, uh, creation, uh, uh, rapid response uh, forces because they need money. And uh, I believe uh, all these countries are not ready to finance uh, own security forces, regional security forces, or uh, even military forces. It's a, a perspective of financing from, uh, let's say, NATO or from European Union budget. This is the main problem. They haven't owned money. That is why they haven't owned, <clears throat> they could have only own army and uh, some country have uh, not so very developed armies as well. Uh, so without uh, uh, thinking in this direction, without developing uh, the common security um, uh, doctrine or common security interest, uh, it's hardly possible to create something like that. I believe that, uh, for example, in this region, in the uh, to Marium region, I, uh, Lithuania, Poland, the Ukrainian perspective, Moldova, maybe Belarus after democratical changes, to create something like that, uh, common uh, rapid forces will be uh, much more easy than to create uh, such kind of the forces inside uh, inter three Marium project, mm -hmm. if it will exist in the future still. That is indeed. I uh, really love that you mentioned, like the uh, the question of uh, of the interest of the Balkan countries, like to join like these uh, integration processes with the uh, more you know, with the more um, delegation of sovereignty, like rapid forces foresee a certain level of trust and certain level of delegation of sovereignty. And uh, Pavel, what do you think uh, the uh, the role of Intermario, if we speak like we are, we have focused a lot on the Black Sea today because of the um, obvious reasons, but Intermario is also about the Adriatic Sea. And the Adriatic Sea represents the huge region of, of, of the Balkans where we still have a very different type of countries which are uh, dominating there. You have the EU and NATO members, you have the European-oriented non-EU and non-NATO members, you have Serbia, which plays still on the um, on another side. Uh, how can or if Intermarium can be used as instrument of stabilization on the Balkans and instrument of bringing countries like Serbia to, to the common European space? First of all, I want to um, underline that we shouldn't extend the borders of the three seas initiatives uh, too far because, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, limited to the common interest. So I want to say that uh, three seas initiative should be based on the countries which is members of European Union, especially these uh, members uh, who joined 2004 and after that. Uh, but I think that strategic, there, there are two strategic groups of countries that are that play a big role. The first one is Eastern Partnership countries, 
and second is the West, Western Balkans countries. I think that there is a lot of similarity in these two groups, and Jagiellon Club uh, two years ago published a report that that, that, that shows that there is some experience, uh, especially uh, um, taking into account relation between uh, relation with the Brussels, which can transfer to the second group. Uh, so some uh, solutions uh, realized in Eastern Partnership could be realized on the Balkans and and and. Um, uh, on the on the second uh, direction as well, uh, so I think that our interest is to enlarge European Union, uh, and of course the most important country is uh, is Ukraine. After that, Moldova and Georgia uh, and uh, Western Balkans as well. Why? I think that there is many reasons why. By but creating a more uh, more stability uh, is a something that is uh, worth to mention because when we enlarge European Union into the countries I mentioned, we uh, transfer the borders of the West toward East, and we will not play a role as a uh, front countries. Uh, we are um, maybe not in the center, but not on the flag, and this is important by means of stability, and by means of many re many economical consequences of that as well. So, so uh, for sure, uh, I think that this initiative should have a good offer uh, to Ukraine, to, to Georgia, but not uh, be a member of that, because I think it will be too... Uh, to comp it, it, the situation will be too uh, too complicated. But uh, what about the security? I'm not an expert about hard security, uh, but we should remember about uh, uh, another format, which I think that is playing a positive role. Uh, Bucharest, the nine countries uh, meet uh, regularly and decide about many important and, and play this role in the NATO as Trimarion can play in the European Union. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure about uh, extending Trimarion initiatives into the hard security issues, uh, but maybe there is some space, I know. But I'm not sure about it. this should be priority. Uh, priority is a political and economical, economical uh, cooperation for sure. You ask about the lowest fruit. I fully agree that infrastructure is something that is worth to mention. I know that we... That we <laughs> discussed about the infrastructure uh, since the beginning of this format and for many people who uh, who um, take part in the conference about the three, three C's initiatives, uh, they uh, many times uh, heard this, uh, this word. But, but the truth is, if you look on the how common Europe is connected, it's still dominated by the West-East uh, axis, but this axis from north to south uh, in our region is, is very is very weak. So, uh, of course, there's a problem about the money, but we should remember that there is some EU money you found that uh, are not well uh, um, used by many countries of our region. So I think that there is no need to uh, uh, to, to transfer even more money because so far money is enough to build much more than we did so far. So. What we need is a better coordination, better mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, using a political tool. Uh, first of all, we should remember that year that the summit that organized year by year is a summit organized by presidents. Mm -hmm. But I think that the role of governments of particular countries is uh, something that is uh, not working properly. In particular countries, there are some uh, prime ministers, some ministers uh, that are mm -hmm. not really interested in this format. And this is a really a challenge, mm -hmm. how to use all political uh, institutions inside our region mm -hmm. to work on this uh, common uh, aim. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. I, I particularly love like, how you mentioned this uh, um, uh, this like psychological aspect of like naming like what is central, what is eastern, is east per se as a negativism, uh, or like where are the borders of the collective West? Uh, I think it is uh, extremely important for understanding of these alliances. But I think that we have like two questions: one from uh, from Lady in the Blue, and one from the uh, young gentleman on the left. Please start. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, and ask the question to whom you want to 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 ask. Although 
I should hope my lecturer voice should carry. I'm Monica. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this fascinating um, conversation. We can understand from your discussion that the path towards new intermarium is paved with security, infrastructure, economy, more economy, more infrastructure. And I'm sure that you've all know, ladies and gentlemen, this anecdotal story about the uh, beginnings of the European Union when one of the founding fathers were asked um, what they should have started with, and the answer was culture. We should have started with culture. Now, this word is not at all present during your presentations, but not even during the program of this conference. And I was just wondering, it's an open question, what do you think about culture? Should we pay attention to it when we think about three Cs? I would be very curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Oh. But your question was uh, to the, yeah, uh, please, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Monica. It's uh, a really fantastic question regarding what is going on in our region. I mean, uh, not only Eastern Europe, but also Central Europe. The culture became a weapon in hybrid war and we observe it especially in the concept of uh, Russian world, Ruski Mir. Uh, it was a basic uh, instrument of the hybrid war, informational war, uh, in Belarus, in Ukraine, in Moldova, even in Poland, in Germany. They used uh, uh, many, many means, many instruments to impact uh, conscience of our societies, using the culture, so-called uh, do you remember probably the uh, words of uh, uh, Pope uh, Fran Francisco who told that the Russian people couldn't uh, commit the crimes because they, they have Dostoevsky? Uh, all um, many things uh, uh, we estimated what, which uh, are happening in Russia and surrounding the Russia across uh, the prism of uh, Russian culture, uh, Russian high culture. And the Russian culture is uh, strongly integrated, uh, integrated and turned into the, the weapon, as I mentioned. And we, as a region, not only Intermarium, but also Tumarium region, uh, need own uh, civilization concept, cultural concept. And, uh, own, uh, we need to protect our culture, our, our world, and we need to create such kind of uh, uh, strong, basic. Uh, cultural center like uh, Russia did. And I believe uh, this region, uh, uh, especially having uh, experience of totalitarian regime, because all these country, uh, countries we are speaking about, uh, uh, they were parts of the Soviet world uh, in the past. Uh, I believe they could start from this, they could create something like this. But uh, again, they need uh, uh, approach, they need common interest, they, they need money to create strong cultural concept or even inter-cultural inter uh, exchange, but it is very important in this case. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have like also Pavel and Tina, yeah, and then uh, I think that I can very, very pass, pass the micro on the next on the next speaker, so you may prepare your question. Yeah, but yeah very good point about the culture, but uh, what is worth to mention, I think that behind the infrastructure is uh, culture as well, because infrastructure is connectivity. Connectivity is a, is a more, is the easiest way to connect the people. So, for example, if I uh, now has a, uh, has a choice, uh, what kind of destination I should uh, choose for my, uh, for my um, holiday, and I see how many hours it will take to go to the south of the, of the Europe because there is lack of road, lack of railway, uh, uh, probably my choice will be Western Europe because it is easiest uh, way to, to travel there. So uh, I think that we should remember that behind this um, technical aspect that we discussed uh, here, there is some uh, social consequences. But it doesn't mean, of course, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, there is no space for creating a common project strictly, directly related to cultural issue. Uh, one comment to this, uh, that you, uh, to your um, uh, voice, because that's true that our 
experience, uh, which is uh, common, um, is about uh, be part of the Soviet world. But I think that the world knows this history very well. But I think that there is a lack of another important story regarding our region is that uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years after the um, after we escaping the, the, the Soviet war, we experiencing a really uh, a very fast developing and, and we was really uh, mm, a very important engine of EU GDP growth. And this is the story that should be, uh, should be uh, this is the message that our region should send to the European Union, to the Western part of the Union, uh, as, uh, first and foremost, but to the world as well. Because I, um, I think that, that there is uh, a lot of, uh, uh, th there is lack of knowledge about this process, how fast we develop, how, uh, how, uh, how our region is changing positively. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is the, st this is the, uh, the job um, uh, behind us. And one case that I think s is uh, very um, interesting in this discussion, when you discuss in Germany which country is a, 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 has a biggest role in the economy of Germany. The answer is very often United States, China, Russia sometimes, but if you look at the numbers, what's the, what's the uh, uh, trade numbers regarding V4 countries? Is uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest region that play uh, the most important role in German economy. So, so uh, this is very interesting why German society are not afraid uh, are not uh, uh, awareness uh, that uh, the the role of our uh, the role of this region is very important, and this this is not about the only uh, um, uh, it's, 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 it, the the direction in in both sides. I mean, Germany plays important role for us, but it is uh, well known. But on the other side, uh, it's um, there is a lack of I think awareness, and this is something that we should more concentrate on. Thank you. Tina? Yeah, I very much agree, I think, with the previous comments. And I would say with the Central and Eastern European states, I mean, culture is really the core of it. Um, yeah, when I talk about private sector or trade or connectivity, I mean, these have to be done not by presidents or political elites. These are done by the citizens, by the people. How do they connect when they speak the common language, when they can relate? This is the core of trade. This is core of any economic ties. And I think if the core was not already there, uh, the, the, the strong core was not there, I don't think this this initiative would have emerged at the first place. The thing is, when we create unions or initiatives, it's a good precedent to give it a bit of a spice, uh, like it was the case of the European Union, as you have mentioned, Monica. The EU founding fathers would have loved to start with the EU identity, but it was very, very dangerous back then. It started as an economic union, and uh, right now, after you know half a century afterwards, this is the EU values, what's, what is the strongest, what has prevailed. It's the stronger than anything else that EU stands for. Uh, it's about the same with EU enlargement or how EU transforms. The core is still the EU values. It just didn't have the right moment back then because it was all about you know cultural identity of France or Germany or, you know, all the worst. But what we see today, um, yeah, even enlargement, Western Balkans, bloc, or anything else, it's still very much influenced by cultural identity and historical understanding and a different context of it. I mean, look at North Macedonia and Greece, this, but, you know, we can't get out of it. And it's, it's core of it. And I think my good... Um, we of that would be in the Central and Eastern European states, the cultural core is very, very strong. Indeed, indeed, uh, as this initiative will, uh, you know, kick off and will, um, will continue and will emerge, will unfold, this will play more and more important role. Uh, and as I said, uh, together with the business forums, running the civil society forums in all its aspects will be very, very key because it's the people to people contact that thrives any initiative at the end of the day. Thank you. You can see from our answers how important actually was your question, because it's really 
uh, evoke a lot of faults and important elements. Uh, what I would like to mention, it's uh, directly connected to cultural aspects. It's actually a question of common identity, which pa Pavel mentioned at the beginning. And any initiative, uh, geopolitical or even uh, economical, but uh, which pretends to go beyond of established concept, needs kind of common ground, not only in the sense of interest, but in the sense of values and uh, let's call it identity as well. And here culture would play definitely a major role. I would like just to remind us the uh, uh, idea of this division for regions itself. For example, like Larry Wolf uh, wrote a uh, famous book about inventing of Eastern Europe as a concept, mainly made by French philosophers. So it was a question of imagination, which appears uh, as a kind of political reality after a while, it's uh, past some years, uh, even uh, decades. And uh, saying a little bit like uh, widely, I would say that as a humanity probably, right now we have, we faced one of the biggest crises. It's not about economy or maybe politics, it's more about imagination. We already came uh, to certain limits as a humanity, as a like uh, civilization in this shape. And what really prevents us, it's not, for example, technological aspects. I suppose we have already much more technological abilities uh, to solve many problems or tasks. But we have already kind of, you know, limitation in our imagination or of ourselves. And in this situation, it's kind of uh, similar. We have already very deeply rooted perception of certain shape of regions dividing like Eastern Central Europe. And this concept becomes already kind of reality. And uh, in the case, if we would like to change, and I suppose one of the reasons why such initiative appears that people, states, and other actors feel that we need to change something. So where is natural needs to reshape something? So we need to change our like conceptual base and our imagination. And this type of like so-called soft elements would play the decision role and culture, horizontal uh, connections and those maybe not so uh, visible hard elements would rather uh, become the main points in this type of uh, projects. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think you can see like that the culture question, Monica, uh, was uh, indeed uh, an essential one. And I can only join the, the, uh, the comments of the, uh, of the honored guests. But we still have like two questions. We are a bit like over, uh, over stretching the time, but I think it's important that we have like one question from the gentleman over there. And when you finish your question, may you please pass the mic to the gentleman in the second row. And yeah. Yeah, so okay. and we will like have like these two last questions and then we finish the discussion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Olaf Heinos, uh, Center for American Studies, and I would like to uh, refer to what Mr. Pavel Usov said about the uh, investment, uh, especially, for example, in infrastructure in the FISIS uh, initiative region countries. So, um, yes, the uh, investment made by particular countries are not huge, but uh, when we, um, for example, take the uh, documents like National Defense Authorization Act from the Department of Defense, we can see that there are serious, uh, ser am serious amounts of investment made by the US government uh, to, um, to, for example, uh, infrastructure projects, military infrastructure projects, projects uh, in the countries of uh, free seas opportunity. Uh, and I, if I can say, uh, for example, we are talking about the uh, Romanian uh, Romanian air base in Campa Turci, which is uh, om, over 130 million of dollars. Uh, we can say uh, about the investment in Poland, which from 2018 to 2023 uh, uh, took about more uh, than 200 million of dollars. 
what is more, there, are, uh, there is also the Balkan, uh, not, sorry, there is a Baltic security initiative, uh, which uh, in the next year, 2024, uh, will exceed the amount of $1 billion uh, transfer to well, boost the security of the uh, Baltic countries. So and this the question is? And, the, uh, and, and my question is, uh, well, it was uh, more likely something that I would like to refer, that there are, all, there, there are not uh, many investments from the uh, particular countries, because, for example, they have the low G GPD, but there are uh, huge investments that are uh, bigger year by year uh, from the, for example, United States Department of Defense. Thank oh, you. Great. Well, thank you. And then may you pass then the, the micro to, yeah, thank you. Who is ready to, to answer this infrastructure funding question? Uh, yes, yeah, please. Small, small comments. Uh, you mentioned it's investments of United States, yeah? to this country. It's not uh, own money taken from the intermarium member uh, states country budget. It's all um, uh, in realized by or financed by United States. This is a problem. You couldn't be a force. You, you couldn't be a strength if you haven't own money. For example, regarding this cultural issue, it was very important, I just thinking, not only cul culture, but also education. If you want to create, uh, uh, speaking about intermarium initiative, if, if you really, this country wants to create something new, something strong, strong something important, uh, there are two issues, except uh, military and security issues, it's culture and education. For example, the European Union as a whole has different initiatives, cultural initiative and education initiatives like uh, Erasmus, Kratus for scientists, for students. Okay, if we uh, estimate intermarium initiatives, uh, three C's initiative as a real strong, independent um, and effective structure, let's create, let's say, intermarium university or intermarium academy, uh, which will support uh, uh, scientists, uh, political, as uh, researchers, social researchers, cultural researchers of this in, of this region, and let's do it for own money, not for European money, not from the budget of uh, uh, European Union or Brussels. Let's all this country invest in this academy, and this academy, uh, let's let's say, will be created in uh, in what country? Uh, in, in Czech Republic or in, in Slovakia or in Poland with different uh, departments, with different uh, faculties. Uh, uh, it will be an example of effectiveness, example of some production, some kind of the uh, results of the product for own money, for, uh, with own initiatives, with own uh, intellectual forces and so on. For that moment we are living for European money, and for American money. Thank you, thank you. And the last question, please. Well, I wanted to understand from each one of you very briefly, what has been the challenges or obstacles to take it forward? Is it because the 3C initiatives is being seen as an alliance against something? That's why the European Union or all the European countries are finding it difficult to come forward and back these initiatives. What has been the one to three fundamental challenges or obstacles to take it forward. If we clarify or identify those obstacles and try to you know, find a remedy, maybe it will be easier to take forward these three C initiatives. I would invite your question, uh, your answers on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please very briefly. Okay, so I will try to answer. Uh, I think that the, there's a problem that the countries that decided to participate in this project, I think that uh, decide to be part, but without uh, enough investment, political investment, economical investment, and everybody look on everybody else, okay, I will check what you do, and if you do uh, something big, I will add something for myself, but you know, when we uh, have a you know, a common job to, to realize, and everybody look on uh, other partners what to do, the, the effect of that is, uh, uh, is something that is not uh, fulfill our expectations. So I think this is the most important problem, that uh, everybody 
uh, every country uh, feel that the general general idea is okay. I we feel that, but we will look what's going on after that, and when this project will uh, gain uh, political mass, uh, we will do something important. So far, we just look on everybody else. And, and of course, uh, it is uh, the question of, uh, of, of, of leadership. Uh, I think that um, uh, from the Polish perspective, who is the leader of this project, uh, still there is a lot of uh, things to do. For example, uh, I think that Poland will uh, Poland, sh Poland shown a lot of uh, uh, a lot of project, but I think that uh, uh, there is lack of coordination among the European countries. How to uh, and and the listen? What's the obstacles that you you have? For example, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in in Hungary, in in Croatia. What's the obstacles to invest more in this project? And I will find a way to how to uh, how to uh, ch challenge that. Maybe. That kind of job will not feel full, uh, perfectly, and this is the job uh, for the next years. And maybe, sorry, one, one, the last sentence. Maybe uh, sometimes in politics is that it, politics is about you know external circumstances, and sometimes uh, you know uh, in European Union, in the United States, we all know the history that there is some, especially big momentum that trigger. Uh, trigger us to do something more, and maybe I, that's my hope that war in Ukraine is that's kind of trigger that changed our imagination and uh, and uh, pressure uh, particular countries to to do more. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to follow up, I think the key point here is that it has been really slow, indeed. And um, as I've already mentioned in my comments, and I'll just uh, flag it once more, the slowness was because it was not really clear what was the initiative about, and there was a lot of skepticism whether it would be a rival or a competitor to the EU's cohesion policy, but now this is flagged that it's not the case. Um, however, why it has been really slow, why things were not running, as I said already, it's because it doesn't have any sectoral dimension until now, and it runs at the very high political, you know, just a dialogue or the summits, but it, it did not yell, has not yet yielded any, you know, sectoral cooperation. If there was projects, if there were sectoral ties, it would have been running itself and it would not have depended on the, you know, changes in the in the president's or political, you know, the, from one election to another election. Um, and I would say, indeed, we need more ownership. Uh, within this initiative from the members of it. And I very much agree with Pavel. I think the current full-scale invasion of Russia, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, is a very good momentum if, because it all affects, first and foremost, the Central and Eastern European states. And if these, you know, block of countries do not show the ownership now, I don't know when will be another, you know, critical moment of showing that. And there is a whole debate and discussion, how do we support Ukraine's reconstruction? and sustainable reconstruction, right? There is a lot going on. And I think that's where the bloc should also vo voice its main voice and what it wants to do and how it wants to support, you know, Ukraine's reconstruction as the country is already partner of it. And I, I very much agree also with earlier comments that there is a lot the countries could just simply team up their forces and bring forward just projects that make sense for them and they could be very well built on already existing EU grants. Thank you. I think uh, that we, we, we were in danger now to, 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 to go into the next panel, which I would uh, personally be very happy, but I'm afraid the time doesn't allow us to do the so, so I urge you to continue the discussion during the coffee break. I just make a little announcement that uh, at 12, uh, at 12 o'clock, the next panel starts here, uh, dedicated to the Russian war against Ukraine with amazing guests like uh, Velina Chakarova, who is here in the room, or the uh, General Raimund Andrzejczak from uh, the uh, Polish uh, General Chief of Staff and other great guests. So I highly recommend you to uh, not to spend too much time in the coffee break, but come back uh, at 12. And in my own interest, tomorrow at uh, 11, there will be a working group dedicated to maritime security, which was already uh, mentioned today. 
uh, with uh, like my organization, European Resilience Initiative Center, is uh, trying to, to address here. I personally invite you at, uh, to be uh, tomorrow at 11 at the working group in the Blue Room. Uh, I hope that Opportunity Foundation forgives me that advertising. Uh, and thank you for this amazing, amazing uh, conference. It was a huge uh, honor to be here with uh, Pavel Usa from University of Warsaw, with uh, Pavel uh, Musawek, Klopia Gelonski with uh, Tina Akhlidiani from uh, Center for European uh, Policy Studies and uh, Oleksii Polekki from Polish uh, Academy of uh, Science. Thank you very much.